Uh, today I would like to discuss with you the concept of lithic miniaturization in late Pleistocene Southern Africa and the current problems with the studies of a small and retouched tool production in particular. Um, ultimately, the aim of the talk today is to initiate a discussion on the terminology we use to study lithic miniaturization and the issues associated with the identification of this phenomenon um, in the archaeological record. Th essentially, the thesis of my talk is that the emphasis on microliths in studies of lithic miniaturization has resulted in a loss of precision in the broadest scope and study of this concept, which includes in southern Africa at least, and in many other parts of the world, the production of small and retouched uh, uh, tools. Technological miniaturization as a much larger phenomenon in human societies, in particular homo sapiens societies, has revolutionized almost all aspects of our lives, from biomedical sciences that keep us alive for longer, to engineering and computer systems that we all rely on every single day, to the way we communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, few people in this room today would not have used their cell phones at least once, uh, would not have checked them or their emails in a portable uh, mobile way. Uh, this would not have been the case 30 years ago. And so we can truly say that we have undergone a technological revolution in the last uh, few decades thanks to technological miniaturization. Um, and we are all, in some way or another, benefactors of this miniaturization process. From an evolutionary perspective, what are the importances of these technologies? Well, the first is that they enable us to use raw materials more effectively and more efficiently. So we've developed economically in, with this technology. They're also more portable, um, and they increase the range of possibilities for the development of modular or composite technologies, that is, those that are put together with multiple components, such as the bow and arrow, for example, which we all know was a major evolutionary milestone, potentially in homo sapiens societies. So making and using miniature technologies also requires increased manual dexterity of the hand, as you can see in these images here, which I believe would have placed unique selective pressures on the evolution of the human hand, something that we've got poor records of for the moment, but might be a major question to answer in the next few decades. I think that together these factors make technological miniaturization an important topic in broader studies of human evolution, and not just archaeology. Moving more specifically to lithic miniaturization, which is a particular manifestation of this larger evolutionary trend in technology, lithic miniaturization remains one of the most pervasive and consequential developments in particularly Pleistocene uh, archaeological uh, technology, but also late Pleistocene archaeology, where we see this phenomenon proliferating around the world. But what is it? Well, firstly, lithic miniaturization refers to the systematic production and use of small retouched or unretouched tools from small cores. Purposeful miniaturization occurs uh, and is therefore different in pattern to the general production of small lithic debris, which occur in nearly every stone tool assemblage that any of us has ever looked at, will contain small bits of chips and chunks. That is not lithic miniaturization. It lacks the purpose. How do we document this archaeologically? I believe that two key factors are, are necessary to demonstrate intentional lithic miniaturization in archaeological assemblages. The first one is relating to raw material size. What we need to demonstrate as archaeologists is the use of small cores in contexts where larger cores are also options for nappers. That is, there is an intentional selection behind the technological process. There should also be an effort to seek out signs of use on the small flakes in the form of residues, macrofracture analysis, edge wear, for which we now have highly evolved techniques um, and technologies. <coughs> and essentially, together, we need to place very tight controls on how we define and document this process in archaeological assemblages by doing at least these two things and possibly more. But more broadly, lithic min miniaturization as a technological phenomenon can be achieved using the same range of reduction strategies as larger technologies. So there really, in my mind at least, there isn't really a significant shift in the way things are made, but rather a reorganization of the technology. And the techniques that can be used include the ones that we're all familiar with, bipolar, freehand, pressure, punch, on a range of rock types. Uh, in fact, we find miniaturization on any kind of rock, really. 
Uh, bipolar reduction is particularly unsurpassed in its ability to reduce core discard thresholds, um, making small cores essentially, and it is thereby potentially a very useful miniaturization technological strategy, but a heavily overlooked one in archaeological assemblages. When these small flakes and bladelets that uh, come from the miniaturization strategy, when they are retouched, they become microlets. Left unretouched and used as such, they fall into a category that I particularly feel is currently undefined in archaeological systematics and often underexamined in archaeological assemblages, but that is usually referred to as waste or debris. So, moving to the first concept on the left side of the diagram, microliths. Well, microliths are widely considered the most visible remnants of lithic miniaturization, and yet we currently have no unified definition for them. Uh, this definitional dilemma has resulted in a loss of precision in studies of the antiquity, evolutionary origins, and in variability in lithic miniaturization more broadly. It's a big hindrance to the study. Just to give you an overview of, of the history of the concept of microliths and, and some of its variability, the term was originally created to describe the more generalized production of small retouched tools. That was sort of Mortier's intention in the, in the late 1800s. Uh, now, many still adhere to this definition, but instead place emphasis on the production of backed geometric tools, whether they're big or small. So size doesn't seem to matter in some definitions of micro -lits. Other assemblages and archaeologists tend to restrict their definition of micro -lits to those containing blade -lits. Okay, So in other words, if something simply becomes twice as long as it is wide and shows parallel dorsal scars and parallel lateral edges, it's enough to single uh, microlithic strategy. Now these examples collectively illustrate how the term microlith has become a catch-all and thus unhelpfully ambiguous category for studies of lithic miniaturization more broadly. Now moving from the problem in general to the problem in specific, I would like to present to you one among many possible examples to illustrate the current dilemmas in studies of lithic miniaturization. This case study is from a terminal Pleistocene uh, lithic assemblage uh, from a site called Nkloane Tsoane in Lesotho, southern Africa, um, and is dated to uh, 14 to 13 ka BP. Provide you a bit of context for the site. Nkloane Tsoane is a very large rock shelter situated in the summer, grass, summer rainfall grassland biome of southern Africa, that's the southeastern corner of our subcontinent within the independent nation of Lesotho. The site sits at an elevation of about 1,600 meters above sea level, so it's relatively highly elevated in a topographically diverse area. Between the mixed to sour grasslands to the west, so opening undulating plains to the west, and the alpine environments of the Lesotho highlands to the east, which during the last glacial maximum actually had glacial formations. And uh, right now is actually under snow at the moment, so not so nice as it is in Toulouse today. Um, the site contains a, a series of rich terminal, late, terminal Pleistocene human occupations referred to collectively as Phase 5 and bracketed by four C14 dates to 14 to 13 Ka Cal BP, which are the focus of today's uh, case study. The study focuses on a sample of the inflow on its own lithic assemblage derived from one of the site's one meter squared excavation areas, that square 4853, highlighted on the uh, site excavation plan. The analyzed material from the square derived from 17 excavated contexts within that thousand year period, representing various hearth features, burning events, and aeolian deposits. All lithics, regardless of size, were analyzed in this particular study. Now, to the geological context of the site, recent surveys, geological surveys of the area show that Nkloana Tawana is in an environment rich in fine grain silicate rocks, that is, chert, agate, chalcedony, um, which are all available within a two to four kilometer radius of the site. So basically, Nkloana Tawana is in a raw material bread basket. These guys have more rocks than they know what to do with. Um, some of these rocks occur in large nodules, as you can see on the bottom right hand side here, in excess of 15 to 20 centimeters long. So they're, they're quite big. Um, and they occur in a variety of sizes, so there isn't really a package restriction in terms of the morphology of the rocks. 
Um, however, there are also much smaller raw materials in the environment, these tiny quartz crystals, uh, which are also napped at the site. Um, and they occur on a mountain just to the north of the site, a single source in the landscape about 10 kilometers away. Um, it's a prominent feature in the landscape that hunter-gatherers are traveling to to get these quartz crystals. The flaked assemblage in general consists, or complete flakes make up about 4% of the entlaw, and it's one lithic assemblage, so not very much. Uh, most of them are quite broken. These flakes are commonly used using a bipolar technique, so that we have fine-grained raw material, no raw material stress, but yet a lot of bipolar. This diagram illustrates the distribution of maximum length and width measurements for the complete flakes that have less than 40% dorsal cortex on them, so in other words, from primary reduction stages. The plot shows that almost all of the flakes fall below the arbitrary 50 mm si length size threshold suggested by Desmond Clark to signal a microlithic reduction strategy. So everything at the site is microlithic, um, according to Desmond Clark's measurement. Some, uh, but not all of these uh, flakes uh, show laminar dimensions. So in other words, they have length width ratios of around 2 to 1, uh, or could be considered bladelets. The flakes showing macro macroscopically visible signs of utilization make up about 1% of the flake assemblage, and retouch tools are almost completely absent. Um, these damage patterns consist of edge nibbling and minor crushing. Uh, impact fractures, likely associated with hunting functions, are indicated by the red arrows on the right-hand side of the diagram. These consist of step-terminating bending fractures, impact burinations, and small secondary spin-off fractures. As such low numbers of utilized and modified flakes are common in southern African lithic assemblages. In fact, they are the norm, uh, dating to the late Pleistocene and then especially in the terminal Pleistocene. And yet we refer to all of these assemblages as microlithic. On to the cores. The cores from Inclona and Sorna form about 12% of the lithic assemblage. So we have really high core frequencies. And all of them agree to go along with it, suggesting that raw materials are being brought to places. So we have a place provisioning strategy in place at Inclona and Sorna, where non-identifiable flakes are excluded from the assemblage. We have frequencies of about 12% of cores. The majority of these cores are small, which show lengths below 29 millimeters and masses below 9 grams. Exceptionally small cores, those are the ones down on the bottom left-hand side here, uh, weighing less than 1 gram, were frequently made on those small crystals that I showed you earlier. A bipolar technique, hammer-on-anvil, not the bidirectional, was used to study the majority of the core, uh, to produce the majority of these cores at Inclona and Sawana especially those below 25 millimeters in length and less than 3 grams in mass. This suggests that at this site, bipolar reduction and technological miniaturization were intimately linked, um, especially on the smaller scale of things. So to summarize, the Inflorna Tsawana lithic assembly shows clear evidence for the systematic production of small flakes and bladelets from small cores um, first, the available survey data that we have suggests that the site is not in a raw materially stressed environment. In fact, miniaturization at the site took place within a decidedly larger raw material context when Natus had these other options. So we believe that other factors such as resource scheduling, uh, place provisioning, mobility may explain their production and these are factors that I'm exploring in my dissertation research on the site. While the assemblages contain no retouch tools, the flakes were utilized. So in other words, there was an intention to produce and retouch tools and to use them as such. So although small, this particular assemblage uh, cannot be considered microlithic unless we stretch its current definition, which I believe is unnecessary. Now, some of you, or many of you, may be asking whether small and retouched tool use is a uniquely Southern African phenomenon, you know, or where else such tools might occur in the record. The short answer to this question is nearly everywhere. Many lithic assemblages, uh, sorry, many lithic assemblages are not classified as microlithic either because they're too old to be microlithic, or because sampling strategies do not focus on the smallest debris or because they contain only small and retouched flakes or too few bladelets. 
Ethnographic observations contain numerous examples of humans using small and retouched toolkits. The Warangi of northern Tanzania make flakes called nchombe of quartz for body incision for decorative or curative purposes and for smoothing bow staves, handles, and wooden utensils, so woodworking is quite important. The Duma-speaking people of Papua New Guinea use bipolar reduction to produce small stone slivers measuring between 20 and 30 millimeters in length. These tools are used for a range of tasks in hand without any form of hafting. None of these examples, importantly, include small retouched tools or microliths. Manioc graters, which um, essentially to process manioc or cassava, were, contain many thousands of small and retouched stone flakes um, hammered into them, and they were a technological mainstay for recent manioc farmers in South and Central America. Now, use where analysis of archaeological stone flakes believed to be components in these manioc craters show signs of plant-based abrasion. In other words, they were used this way quite recently amongst uh, farmers in South Central America. Australian ethnographic observations contain numerous examples of humans using small and retouched toolkits. Aboriginal populations in Victoria, Australia, had at least six categories of small and retouched flakes and chips in their stone toolkits. These small tools served multiple purposes, including cutting, skinning, chiseling, scarification, um, and they were frequently used hafted or unhafted. Uh, the hafted components, the small hafted flakes, make up the most ca uh, characteristic Aboriginal composite tools known as death spears, or top knives, as you can see on the right-hand side here. A writing of these Australian tools and unre unretouched toolkits, Mulvaney notes that because of their unretouched and small qualities, that they are largely unrecognizable to archaeologists. So their negative character derives from their size and unretouched nature as to be unrecognizable uh, components of an, uh, of an implement in, in the archaeological record. This is a problem. Where else in the archaeological record might systematic small and retouched tool production occur? Well, such tools appear as early as 1.7 million years ago in Ethiopia at the site of Gaba 4, where unretouched flakes between 25 and 30 millimeters in length were systematically produced and used. Minuscule unretouched flakes made from recycled flint were identified at the lower Paleolithic site of Kesem Cave in Israel, dated to between 400 and 200,000 years ago. These appear to have been used for butchery. Systematic small tool production using small, that is less than 50 millimeters, Lavawa cores has been recorded in the mid Pleistocene at Omo Kibish in Ethiopia, in association with the earliest Homo sapien fossils yet discovered. Small unretouched chert flakes and bladelets show clear signs of utilization in hafting residues in the early later Stone Age deposits at Sehong Hong Rock Shelter in the Sutu, dated to 26,000 years ago. At the Hoka River site in the Pacific Northwest, small and retouched court shirts were found hafted and used to butcher salmon. Collectively, these examples show that while systematic small and retouched tool production is certainly older than microliths, they are also a more consistent and more persistent feature of human lithic technology. Jeanette Deacon's PhD research in Southern Africa, I think, sums this pattern up quite nicely. Uh, she showed two clear and distinct patterns of lithic miniaturization in <laughs> Southern Africa. In the Holocene, these processes involved the production of bladelets and small flakes, which were then backed to form microliths. And that's the relationship you can see here between backed microliths and bladelet cores. There's a very strong relationship. In the late Pleistocene, in contrast, in Southern Africa, we see high numbers of bladelet cores, flake and bladelet products, but very few retouch tools. So the pattern is completely different, but yet they all are processes of lithic miniaturization. This is a different and distinct form, though, the one that we find during the late Pleistocene, and we currently don't have a concept for it. So without appropriate terminology to identify and compare lithic miniaturization in, in, involving small and retouched tools, we risk sweeping these tools under the microlithic rug. The microlithic concept either needs to be used more carefully and clearly defined upon each and every use, which to me sounds a bit arduous, or supplemented with clearer and more accurate sets of terms. What could such terms be? Three terms could be used to describe systematic small and retouched tool production to distinguish it from microliths. They are nanolith, cryptolith, or microdebitage. 
However, if we follow the nomenclature rules in science, words that currently have a definition in use elsewhere cannot be repurposed for others. And unless we want to further create more confusion in studies of this phenomenon, are these three terms in use? Yes, they are. Referring, nanolith refers to the formal prismatic core technology scaled to produce bladelets with a mean, le mean length of less than one centimeter, according to Bettinger. Cryptolith, as um, coined by Alex McKay, means subgram core technologies. That clearly doesn't describe the wide breadth of, of material we're looking at, uh, in, at least in Southern Africa and elsewhere. And microdebitoid is the most likely candidate in fact has a very clear definition in the literature, which is that it is defined as all small stone flaking residue less than one millimeter, that's clearly not the lithic material we're dealing with, in maximum dimension. This is a geomorphological concept, um, and it's well published and well studied elsewhere. Another option to solving this definitional dilemma is to create a new term. If this is the option we as a community choose, then I would propose the word sinciless. Sinciless is an amalgam of the Isi Klasa word for small, aman tzintzin, and the Greek derived word for stone, lith. Now, some may object to introducing a new term for stone tool production, but as this paper shows, the long established term microlith is plainly inadequate for contemporary research on technological miniaturization. Others may object to introducing a new term derived in part from a non European language, but Isi Klasa is one of the languages of the countries, that is South Africa and Lesotho, in which sinciliths have first been identified. And thus it is clearly enti it is entirely appropriate to incorporate Isikosa into their definition. Moreover, the long-standing sources for stone tool taxonomy, that is Latin, Greek, French, and English, have no intrinsically greater power for describing Pleistocene age stone tools than any other language. So if we revisit the lithic miniaturization scheme, we can now refer to the use of unretouched small tools as sinciliths, which are the result of technological processes and demonstrated by intentionality in ways different to microliths. Now, this is not just about playing around with names and introducing new concepts. One of the major differences between us and our closest living primate relatives is our ability to manipulate small objects. That is a clearly important evolutionary process that we need to understand in more detail. This ability is an evolutionary inheritance that archaeologists have shown has evolved with the manufacture and use of increasingly small toolkits. Yet, if we continue to lump various forms of lithic miniaturization together under the microlith banner, we will be less able to and less capable of developing accurate understandings of the temporal and geographical variability of these processes and of their role in human behavioral evolution more broadly. I'm reluctant to add a new term to lithic studies. I think, personally, that we have too many already. But the production and use of small and retouched toolkits is an important and critically understudied issue in human behavioral and technological evolution. So to conclude, the current wide definition for microliths has led to a definitional dilemma. This dilemma has resulted in a loss of precision in the studies of toolkit miniaturization, which also involved systematic small and retouched tools. Given the current, our current lack of suitable terminology to describe this process, I propose sinciliths, a term that comes from with a strict definitional criteria requiring that archaeologists demonstrate the systematic production and use of small and retouched toolkits. Sinciliths production is a more pervasive and widespread pattern in lithic miniaturization than just microliths. Now, some may disagree that a new team term is needed, and I agree, but our current situation demonstrates a need to take stock and to develop clearer terms in order to restore precision to studies of the antiquity, evolutionary origins, and variability in lithic miniaturization strategies. And I would just like to thank my host uh, and sponsor institutions and to all of you for your patience today. Thank you. So, um, I think we, we have time for questions, or we also have a session uh, left at the end of this morning for, for more discussion. So, will we move on? If someone has a question. If there's any burning questions right now. Garth. 
I have spent my entire long career uh, battling with uh, my colleagues who are fearful of new terms. This is the first time in a long time that I've listened to a closely reasoned argument for a new term. I think it makes good sense. The need is definitely there, and I urge that we adopt it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think one of my purposes today was actually to uh, thank you, Garth. Um, was was to actually for us to maybe take a vote. Um, I think perhaps now or in the session uh, at the end of the morning, uh, if we could take a vote, uh, yay or nay, is the concept worth it? Uh, and uh, leave it to democracy to decide. Um, I'll do the job, the, the Cameron move, and uh, step down if <laughs> <laughs> Steve. Yes. I, I would suggest that we wait until the end. The end yep. in the morning, or at least for perhaps. We could wait. Yeah, we could. Well, let's wait till the afternoon. For me. Yeah. Let's wait till the early evening. Uh, with yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion yeah. related to this, and I, I personally do not share the vision that uh, Garth and you have. Yeah. I personally don't see the reason for it, mm -hmm. as you said. Yeah. Okay. We could so. More discussion about that. Okay. So let's wait till the end of the day. Yeah.